end. So thank you everybody for being there for this uh, penultimate session of the Metaphysics Seminar because we have a new one uh, at the last minutes on the 20th of January with Welcome Conference. But for today, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Barbara Wetter from uh, the Freie Universität from Berlin. And uh, we we'll have the pleasure to hear our talk about uh, modal epistemology and its axiom. Uh, you have one hour for the talk, and then we'll have one hour session of uh, Q&A, if that's all right with you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. I'm literally doing this talk between two different seminars that I'm running today. Um, so there was no way I could um, I could travel and be away. That's just too much going on this semester. But thank you for making it possible uh, in this way. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is uh, work in progress. It's um, sort of bits and pieces from a book manuscript that I'm writing. And it's the first time I'm trying it as a talk, so I haven't timed it. Uh, but one hour should be more than enough time for it. I'm going to be talking about modal epistemology. So maybe just to give you a little bit of background, um, the material in the talk comes from a book manuscript in which I try to develop an epistemology of modality. I'll say a little bit more about what that requires in a moment. Um, that's based on our understanding of our own abilities as we uh, need it and get it in our own actions. Um, and then in later parts of the book, I look at different things people have said about modal epistemology and um, explain how either they're wrong or I can accommodate it. And this is uh, one of the places where I say they're wrong. But it's not meant to be just negative. It's part of a positive project um, of providing a different epistemology of modality. Um, I would also draw on some historical points, um, at least from my conversations with uh, Florian. I got the sense that some of you may be more competent on those historical matters than I am, and I'd be very uh, curious to hear what you think about that. I'm just going to draw a little bit on, on some historical points. All right. So here's what, wait, here's what this is about. Um, my talk uh, is situated in modal epistemology. Um, you can, it's the epistemology of modality, but that's just too long. So I say modal epistemology, which is long enough, um, which is, well, just the epistemology of the, the theory of our knowledge of possibility and necessity. How can we know what is possible and necessary as opposed to knowing what's actually the case? And people have often thought that the epistemology of modality is particularly problematic because, for instance, we can see what's actually the case. We can't see if it's necessary or contingent. And people also think we can't see mere possibilities. I actually doubt that. Um, if you look at contemporary theories of perception, I'm not the only person to doubt that. But anyway, um, there seems to be a particular problem about how can we know about what's merely possible or what's necessary. Now, many people who asked this question um, some decades ago, um, I think the term modal epistemology became popularized by a paper that Peter van Inwagen wrote of the same title. Um, Many people who asked this question came to it from the methodology of philosophy. So many people who were interested in how we know what's possible or necessary got to that question because they were worried about very particular philosophical questions, um, uh, very particular sort of questions of possibility and necessity. So people in the philosophy of mind were wondering, how can we know whether it's possible for there to be philosophical zombies um, and things like that, or people who... Uh, we're reading Kripke and ask, how do we know whether it's possible for water to be X, Y, Z instead of H2O? And then, you know, philosophers made claims to knowledge in these areas. And so it stands, so we might as well ask, how do we get that knowledge? And so a lot of my epistemology up until very recently was really philosophical methodology and was concerned with how can we philosophers know what is metaphysically possible or necessary? But more recently, people have turned to a sort of slightly different reading of the question, or at least have also included that. Um, and that is something you can also find already a little bit in the Van Inwagen paper I just cited. Um, Van Inwagen, in the paper called Modal Epistemology, professes skepticism about our knowledge of sort of very remote metaphysical possibilities. The philosophical zombies is sort of the paradigmatic case for that. But he prefaces that by saying, well, clearly we have all kinds of knowledge about what's possible and necessary. Um, you know, I, I know that it's possible for me, I, this is not his example, I know that it's possible for me to take the bike and get home. Um, I know that, um, you know, I can't fly home, that's a kind of necessity. We know all kinds of possibilities and necessities. 
Um, what Van Inwag in, in the 1998 paper Professor Skepticism about is the remote possibilities that often figure in metaphysics. Now, over the last 10 to 20 years, people have become much more interested in how do we know about uh, these sort of ordinary possibilities? Um, because clearly here we do have knowledge. There's sort of the, the question isn't whether we have it, the question is how it can be explained. And that's the project that I'm interested in. So I'm not going to talk about knowledge of remote possibilities of philosophical zombies or anything like that. I'm going to try to understand how we ordinary humans, whether or not we've ever taken a philosophy class, uh, can, know, can know about what's possible and what's necessary. And my focus in this talk, uh, although I'm interested in that question in general, my focus in this talk uh, will be on a particular way of knowing um, that's been popular in the recent literature, precisely where people focus on ordinary mode of knowledge. Um, all right, so I said I'm going to talk about mode epistemology and the T axiom. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you the T axiom. Um, it's, Again, I, I don't know where, where people are coming from, so there are different labels for it. I'm going to call it the T axiom because that's what it's called in modal logic. The T axiom just says if P, then possibly P. Um, in modal logic, um, people often think that, um, so you start with axiom K, which has something to do with basically being able to apply modus ponens with necessity operators. And then you add the T axiom, and then you've got a logic that might have a claim to having something to do with metaphysical um, modality. Um, or if you're interested in the kind of ordinary possibilities I'm interested in, some people like Tim Williamson actually use the T-axiom to characterize what it is to be an objective as opposed to a merely epistemic um, or deontic modality. So the T-axiom says what, whatever is actual is possible, uh, whatever is uh, the case is also possibly the case. Um, of course, there's the reverse of it, which says whatever's necessary is also true, but I'll be interested. That's just logically equivalent, but I'll be interested in this reading. So this is supposed to be the absolutely minimal standard um, for a kind of possibility that's a real and objective possibility, something that's got to do with how things are, as opposed to epistemic possibility having to do with what we know about things or deontic possibility having to do with permissions and obligations. Clearly T doesn't hold um, for deontic possibility. It's not the case if you read possibly as permitted, it's not the case that everything that actually happens is permitted. Uh, so there you can see the contrast. Um, the T axiom even has a Latin name, as I'm sure many of you are aware, indicating that it has a long history, so people often uh, also cite it as the principle of esse ad possum, from being to being able or being possible. All right, so how do these two things uh, relate to each other? Um, well, a lot of people who work in modal epistemology, and in particular people who are interested in ordinary modal knowledge, as I am, have thought that the T-axiom is maybe not the most interesting, but maybe the easiest way for us to get ordinary modal knowledge. So just to um, illustrate that, I, I have a few quotes for you. Uh, Peter Geech is often cited as saying that the T-axiom is clear if anything in modal logic is clear. Not going to agree with that because it's about logic. Peter van Inwagen in the already cited paper, when he talks about ordinary modal knowledge, which he's not a skeptic about, gives an example for you know how we can clearly have ordinary modal knowledge. And he says we can validly deduce the conclusion it's possible for there to be orchids from the non-modal premise there are orchids. Uh, this knowledge is not based on what I have called basic modal knowledge. Um, so we don't need any other modal knowledge to feed into it. And I do not regard it as mysterious, because all it is is applying a logical uh, principle. Peter Hawke says that the T axiom in, in modal epistemology is entirely beyond philosophical dispute. Philippe Leon says it provides us with the simplest sort of case of knowledge of possibility. And Sonia Rokovroyes calls it close to conceptual truth, if not conceptual truth proper. Those last three people we'll see in a moment also use the T-axiom in a more substantial um, account of the epistemology of modality. Um, so I'm going to dissent uh, from this consensus. I'm going to say that if we're concerned with the knowledge that ordinary humans have of possibility in ordinary contexts outside the philosophy classroom, never having, having taken a logic class, 
we shouldn't really be appealing to the T axiom because it's just not clear that that plays any role for ordinary modal thought. Okay, now to get there, I first need to draw a distinction. And this is also not my own distinction, it's been noted by Rebecca Hanrahan. Um, when you talk about the inference from actuality to possibility, or say ab esse ad posse, there are really two readings of what that inference is. There's the deductive reading, um, and that's the one that you sort of get as a logical principle, where from a complete proposition, you infer that complete proposition prefixed with the possibility operator. It was raining yesterday, therefore possibly it was raining yesterday. But very often when you look at sort of more natural examples for inferences from actuality to possibility, you'll get something more like it was raining yesterday, therefore that yesterday, therefore it's possible that it will rain tomorrow. So this is not a deductive form of inference, it's an ampliative inference. It's sort of, if it works, it expands our knowledge, but of course it's um, not deductively valid. It takes us from actual um, truth, maybe in the past, to possible truth, maybe in the future, or actual truth somewhere to possible truth elsewhere. Now, I should think, um, it's difficult to argue for this, but if you sort of just consider the kinds of inferences you make in everyday life, um, I would like to suggest that the common and natural form of inference that we often employ is really the ampliative one. If only because that's the more interesting one, because if we already know something's possible, something's actual, the deductive inference that it's also possible doesn't sort of help us very much. Whereas the amplitude inference, that's really important and interesting. Uh, it really helps me extrapolate from what I've seen happen to sort of possibilities that I should, you know, take into account and in, say planning what to do in the future. So I submit that it's the amplitude um, inference that's common and natural. But as I've already said, it's the deductive inference that's deductively valid and therefore justifies these, all these lovely pronouncements, um, you know, entirely beyond philosophical dispute, simplest sort of case, close to conceptual truth. Okay, now can we use the deductive validity of the first inference to somehow um, help us understand um, the um, goodness, when it is good, of the amplitude inference? That's exactly the project that you find in some contemporary um, theories and modal epistemology. So I'll briefly look at that. Uh, Sonia Rocco Royce is perhaps best known for this uh, kind of view, but Peter Hawke has defended it, and Philippe Leon, so the people I just quoted earlier, um, have also sort of written roughly in this direction. Here, the idea is that we can basically rationalize the ampliative inference um, in the following way. We start with an observation about actuality. I'll switch the example from the raining uh, to Rocco Royce's example. Um, so her example is um, she's had a desk in her office and that desk um, has broken. A is F, so desk one is broken. By axiom T, deductively valid, uh, we can infer that therefore it's possible for that desk to be broken. And now comes the amplitude step. Now we look at a different desk, maybe the new one she's bought for her office, and we realize that desk two, B, is relevantly like the earlier desk, A. And this is where the ampliative reasoning comes in. Um, since B is relevantly like A, whatever's true of A might also be true of B, and therefore we conclude since A is possibly F, B is also possibly F. So here we have analogical reasoning, or maybe we've got induction Never mind, some ampliative step going on here. What matters to me is that um, the, the place where we introduce modality is the deductive step. It's really just the, the T axiom uh, that gives us the step from actuality to possibility. And then everything else is just general analogical reasoning, inductive reasoning, what have you, whatever ampliative reasoning we have generally. But it's the deductive step, it's axiom T that gets us from actuality to possibility. So what we've done here is factor an ampliative inference from actuality to possibility into a deductive inference from actuality to possibility and an ampliative inference that sort of takes us further. And that looks very nice, 
But why exactly should we think that's the way that our ordinary modal knowledge is structured? So why should we factor the ordinary ampliative inference into a deductive part which introduces the possibility and the ampliative part which takes part of the, its being ampliative? I think the answer is just that it seems charitable. It's just the best way of making sense of our ordinary reasoning. What other justification could we have um, to make the ampliative inference if not via the deductive one and then general ampliative reasoning? Now, my argument uh, to finally get there is I want to argue that in fact, this is not a very charitable interpretation of our ordinary ampliative um, reasoning. I want to argue that ordinary reasoners do not, and actually rightly do not, so should not employ axiom T in their reasoning. Why do I think that? And this is where I draw a little bit on the history of philosophy, um, though I should say I, I love Aristotle, but I'm not an Aristotle scholar. Uh, so I really just want to use this to make a point. If you've ever looked at um, the history of um, the philosophical thought about possibility and necessity, um, you may have, you will probably have come across a distinction which some people express as a distinction between one-sided and two-sided possibility. One-sided possibility is basically just limited on one side. Um, it's just sort of the opposite of impossibility, basically. So something is one-sidedly possible just in case it's not necessarily not the case. But there's also a notion of two-sided possibility, which is called two-sided because it's limited on two sides. It's sort of between necessity and impossibility. So it's neither necessary that P, nor is it necessary that not P, um, and two-sided possibility is in between these two. Um, and of course, one-sided possibility is just the modern notion of possibility. Um, Two-sided possibilities these days usually called contingency, at least in circles where people have any knowledge of modal logic. Um, and from what I understand, though, again, I'm not a historian, um, this distinction with the term contingency was already drawn like this in the Middle Ages. Now, um, I, I just said, if you look back in the history, you can find this distinction in Aristotle, um, and I mentioned here prior analytics and de interpretatione. Um, of course, Aristotle is not one to miss an ambiguity, and of course he points out the ambiguity, and in different places he, from, what I, from what I'm told, he uses different notions, sometimes the one-sided one, sometimes the two-sided one. Uh, in the prior analytics passage, he finds it necessary to argue for the one-sided notion being a good notion of possibility, um, but then he conducts his own mode of logic in terms of two-sided possibility. And again, at least that's what I'm told by the experts. So two-sided possibility seems to be a rather, oh, sorry, I should add, here's a, here's a hidden premise here. I think uh, whatever we think about the claims Aristotle makes in terms of uh, their truth value, I think Aristotle is a really good guide to our natural ways of thinking about things. Um, I have um, been talking quite a bit to developmental psychologists who find all kinds of concepts in uh, tiny little infants, and all these concepts sound extremely Aristotelian. Um, anyway, that's just a side note. Um, I think the two side, the fact that Aristotle uses the two-sided notion, despite being aware of the dis difference, shows that the two-sided notion is a perfectly good notion. And um, if you look at the way that we ordinarily think and talk, we don't have much use for the distinction between them, but it's not very clear that we use the one-sided notion at all. Um, so if I tell you it's possible that two plus two equals four, I mean, not you, if I tell that to people who've never taken any modal logic, um, if I tell them it's possible that two plus two equals four, they might look at me very puzzled. Or if I tell them that it's possible um, that I am human, they might also look at me with great puzzlement. Um, because of course, you know, it's not just possible, it's necessary. Um, and then we might resist calling it possible, which might indicate that sometimes um, it's the two-sided notion that we use. Now, why does that matter? Well, the one-sided notion is the one that validates the T-axiom. Um, because it excludes only impossibility, um, 
you know, anything that's necessarily the case is not necessarily not the case and therefore possible. Um, and in any case, everything that's actually the case, whether or not it's necessary, will also be possible. The two-sided notion of possibility does not validate the T-axial because something that's actually the case might be necessary. And if it's necessary, then it's not two-sidedly possible. Therefore, actuality of, for, for the two-sided notion of possibility does not entail possibility. It's only actuality that's not also, that doesn't come with necessity. Now, of course, we could have that inference instead of the T-axiom, but that would already be modalized. And so that's not what we're looking for. So is it really so easy to, conf so is that really an important distinction? Well, um, people are prone, I think, to confuse the two notions. And just to give you an example of how prone people are to confuse the two notions, here is a literal quotation from a paper by Paul Weiss that appeared in 1955 in Philosophical Studies, no less. So it went through peer review and everything. Paul Weiss um, argues for, gives the following argument, um, which of course is supposed to generate a paradox. Premise one, a necessary truth cannot possibly be false. Premise two, a necessary truth is true. <coughs> premise three, what is true is possibly true. And premise four, what is possibly true could be false. Um, what is that? And then from these premises, necessary truth, um, is true, um, can't possibly be false, is possibly true, but therefore could be false, um, suddenly from two, three, and four, we get a statement that contradicts statement one, the necessary truth could be false, but the necessary truth is true, because it's true, it's possibly true, because it's possibly true, it could be false. Now, um, in 1955, of course, um, was a time when people were already quite capable of doing logic, and Aristotle himself had already pointed it out, um, if you look at this argument, clearly it's a fallacy. I'm not showing you the argument because I want to endorse it. I think it's clearly a fallacy. Why is it clearly a fallacy? Well, because premise three, what's true is possibly true. Um, that is a true premise only if we read possibly um, in the one-sided sense, but premise four, what's possibly true could be false, is true only if we read possibly in the two-sided sense. So we've got a fallacy of equivocation here. So again, I don't, you know, I don't uh, want to support the argument. All I want to use it to show is that even philosophers who got their papers published in philosophical studies in the 20th century um, were still prone to that kind of confusion. Um, and so it would be very, um, and Aristotle felt it necessary to point out the distinction. So I think it would be, it's implausible that um, prior to having done any philosophy, having practiced the kinds of disambiguations we need to explain this, um, one wouldn't be prone to those kinds of confusions. Okay, now why does that matter? Sorry, I just realized I a piece of paper. Okay, so why does this matter? Um, if ordinary modal thinkers are either using a concept of two-sided possibility or a concept that sort of conflates one-sided and two-sided possibility because we don't really care about the case of necessities, then axiom T will just not be a warranted form of inference for ordinary thinkers. Um, and by ordinary thinkers, I mean any of us when we're not sort of thinking really hard about philosophy. It won't be um, a warranted um, form of inference, because if we're using a notion of two-sided possibility, it's just invalid. Um, and if we're conflating the two notions, then it will actually lead us into contradiction, as we've just seen in the case of Paul Weiss. So we've already reached the conclusion. Um, I think axiom T isn't the charitable reading of how ordinary thinkers think about ordinary modality. Um, because it leads into invalidity or confusion. Now, one response that I get when I make this claim is that people say, yeah, but, you know, actually, even you can even interpret the Aristotle passage in this way. Um, 
actually what happens is there's just a notion of one-sided possibility. That's what possibly expresses. And then there's pragmatics. Um, and pragmatics makes it kind of bad to say possibly P if P is also necessarily true. But that's just pragmatics. That has nothing to do with deductive validity. So that's the rejoinder. Possibly always means one-sided possibility or else pragmatic. It might be, for instance, that we, we can explain it, for instance, in terms of a Gracian maxim of quantity, a quanti uh, maxim that tells us to be informative. That would make it infelicitous to assert a possibility when we could instead assert a necessity. And so by asserting the possibility, we're sort of inf giving to a we're implicating in Grice's term that there's nothing stronger we can assert and therefore um, that the, the necessity claim would be false. Now, that is a rejoinder I get. Um, I'm not sure it's a good rejoinder because it makes the possibility statement itself kind of infelicitous. Uh, it makes the possibility statement infelicitous even just when we know the actual truth and it sort of is right. Um, but I think for very different reasons, it is not um, a good rejoinder to the argument I've just given. And I'll give you two ways of seeing that it's not. First, um, even if the whole story possibly just meaning one-sided possibility, everything else being pragmatics, even if all that's true, I'm not talking semantics here. I'm doing epistemology. And it's just not clear that it's in any way transparent to speakers, I was talking about thinkers, it's, you know, that that um, it's at all clear to ordinary speakers or thinkers, so of what's part of the semantics and what's part of the pragmatics. Just to give you, um, just to give you an, an, an analogous example, um, pragmatics and Gricean maxims are also sometimes used to defend the semantics of the conditional, where the conditional really just expresses um, sort of the truth table. Uh, so if P then Q in ordinary language, or the, its equivalents in other languages, really just expresses, um, you know, either P is false or Q is true. Um, and that's the truth conditional reading of if then. And then often people use the sort of Gricean maxims to say, yeah, you know, it sounds weird. Uh, it has all kinds of weird consequences. They're all true. They're just pragmatically bad. And that's why we resist them. And... I don't want to take any stand on that, but I just want to point out that even if that's true, it does not follow um, that ordinary speakers would, you know, be able to know that certain inferences are valid, which are valid only given the truth conditional understanding of if P then Q. For instance, the fact that uh, P entails if Q then P. Um, if it's not transparent to ordinary speakers what the semantics of the conditional is and what the pragmatics, then you know, ordinary speakers won't know that P entails if Q then P. And so it would be a good form of inference for them uh, to draw that conclusion. So in doing epistemology, the semantics pragmatics distinction might not be all that relevant. Um, further, however, I think it's just not clear that it's all pragmatics and here I'm going to go a little bit into linguistics. Um, and actually, as I said, this is part of a book project. The book project is all over the place. So I'm drawing on Aristotle and linguistics and philosophy of action and developmental psychology. And I'm not an expert on any of those things. I'm just putting them all together and I hope that that yields something new and interesting. So it's not actually clear that um, it is all pragmatics. Um, so let's look into um, the linguistics here. The kind of phenomenon that we're dealing with, when we say it's infelicitous to assert a possibility when really we think or know that there's a necessity, it's called a scalar implicature. In scalar implicatures, an expression with a weaker reading is taken to implicate uh, the negation of a stronger alternative. So if I say P or Q, you kind of infer that I don't think that both P and Q because if I did, then I would have said P and Q. If I say some Fs do something, then you sort of infer that I don't think that all Fs do that thing. Uh, because if I did, then that's what I should have said. And likewise, if I say possibly P, 
you kind of infer that I don't think that necessarily, P, because if that's what I thought, then that's what I would have said. So by making a weaker statement, um, at least sort of without a lot of context forcing us to make the weaker statement, we're sort of suggesting in some way uh, to our audience that we don't make the stronger statement and that we don't believe or at least don't know the strongest statement. Now, and here I'm drawing on uh, linguists in particular, um, um, Kierkegaard and some, uh, some collaborators. Um, some linguists have pointed out that these scalar implicatures actually don't quite behave in the way that um, classic implicatures do. That it's not quite clear they're really just pragmatic, but there's reason to think they're semantic. So here's what they say, pragmatic phenomena apply to a whole utterance because the, the pragmatic is supposed to be, if I'm making this assertion um, and I'm you know, obeying all these, um, all these maxims that you find in Grace, for instance, um, then my assertion sort of tells you what is supposed to be the most informative and so on and so forth. Um, but these kinds of pragmatic phenomena sort of get lost when you have um, a sentence not as something that you're asserting, but as just part of a larger uh, sentence. Uh, so pragmatic phenomena of the kind that we're talking about here tend to get lost when a sentence is embedded, for instance, as the antecedent of a conditional. But scalar implicature actually remains in place when you embed a sentence in, for instance, the antecedent of a conditional. Take the sum, which is supposed to um, implicate not all. Um, if I say, if some students pass, I'll be happy, but if all students pass, I'll be even happier. Um, that would be contradictory if some entailed not all, because if I say, if some students pass, I'll be happy, but then if all students pass, that would entail not. It's not the case that some students pass. Okay. Second sentence. Now, this takes the can and must, which is a lot like possibly and necessarily, if you can fire him, that's your call, but if you must fire him, there's no choice. So this says, um, if it's possible but not necessary, then it's your call, but if it's necessary, then it's not your call, you have no choice. And again, if, if we read the can in the first antecedent as, um, sorry, as, as including the possibility of, 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 of a, sorry, as, not excluding the must, then if you can, including if you must fire him, that's your call, then we get contradiction with the second one. But clearly this is not contradictory. The way that these linguists have suggested we deal with this is that scalar implicatures are actually part of the semantics, but they're silent. Um, and um, there's, they consist in a kind of operator that I have called only. I think they don't call it quite that, but they sort of paraphrase it with only. Where um, only P is true, if and only if, P is true, but all relevant alternatives to P are either entailed by it or false. Which is basically just to say, P is the strongest thing that's true in the vicinity. Okay, and then that makes sense of our, of our sentences because uh, I can say that if only some students pass, I'll be happy, but if not only some but all students pass, I'll be even happier. Or if you only can fire him, that's your call. Only can in the sense of there's nothing stronger, but if you must fire him, there's no choice. So that makes sense of, of these kinds of sentences. Okay, why, why does that matter again? Well, um, if these linguists are right, um, and from what I understand, that is a very serious option in linguistics, um, maybe even the main option, I'm not entirely sure, it depends on who you ask. Um, if that's right, then even if the semantics of the word possibly by itself is just one-sided possibility, the semantics of most of our sentences including the word possibly, will actually express two-sided possibility because there will be the silent operator, in there, which is not part of the semantics of possibly, but it's usually going to be there. And of course, we're interested not just in the word, but in the whole sentence, uh, because that's what makes premise or a conclusion. So if these linguists are right, then the T axiom is actually um, invalid for a lot of sentences that we ordinarily 
use. And so once again, not just for risk of confusion, but actually for invalidity, we should not be using the T-axiom in everyday modal thought. So am I disagreeing with these people? Well, it depends on exactly what they're saying. Um, Geach says the T-axiom is clear if anything in modal logic is clear. Sure, I don't want to disagree with that. Um, I do think um, that it's, it's an achievement, it's an advance that we're doing a modal logic with one-sided possibility uh, where the T-axiom is valid. Um, I think that's the better logic. Um, and so there's reason why the T-axiom, as Hawke says, is entirely beyond philosophical dispute. It's even true, jumping to the last quote from Rock of Royce, that when the modality involved is alethic, the principle T is close to being a conceptual truth, if not a conceptual truth proper. What I'm questioning is that our ordinary notion of modality is alethic in this sense, and that we sort of have at our disposal in ordinary thought an alethic notion of possibility. Okay, so far I've been only negative. Um, still, I think it's a, I hope it's an interesting point to make because even people who don't make much of the T axiom in modal epistemology uh, always have this little statement. Well, of course, there's one easy way of gaining modal knowledge, um, this, and now let's get onto the more difficult things. So I will say, no, it's not that easy. And of course, if you look at the, the kinds of um, rationalizations I've given, given earlier from Rocco Royce and Hawke and, and Leon to, to some extent, um, that's just, I just want to disagree with that being a good description of what ordinary modal thinkers do. It might be a good description of what some idealized modal thinkers do after having taken a class on modal logic. But I think there are alternatives for dealing with the ampliative principle. So I want to end on a positive, albeit a little speculative note. Why don't we take the ampliative principle simply at face value? A lot of our ordinary reasoning isn't deductively valid and doesn't include deductively valid parts. Um, I think we're quite happy to take inferential risks um, in our ordinary thinking and reasoning, um, and we use all kinds of ampliative principles. Why not just use an ampliative principle that takes directly from actuality to something more modal? So, I think we can just take the ampliative principle at face value as inferring. Um, now, from what actually happens, from what maybe what actually happened, to the presence of a possibility that sort of lasts and might manifest or actualize again um, at different occasions. So what I'm really suggesting is that perhaps the kind of inference we're making when we're making the amplitude inference is an inference from what happened to the presence of some stable underlying properties, properties that I personally like to think of as potentialities and dispositions or abilities, but you might just think of them as some sort of deray possibility, um, but just something that's stable that might remain in place and will manifest itself again later. So the paradigmatic case of, of this kind of inference isn't, you know, it was raining yesterday, therefore possibly it was raining yesterday. It's more like, well, I saw you ride a bike yesterday, so you must have the ability to ride a bike, so you'll probably ride a bike again in the future. Or, you know, um, the last piece of sugar that I put into my coffee dissolved. So probably there's something about sugar that makes it capable of dissolving in coffee. So probably the next piece of sugar will dissolve again. That kind of thing. So it's a kind of, I think, an abductive step from what happens to there being something that made it happen. Um, and I am told um, that... The old principle, the ab esse ad posse. Um, again, now I'm out of my depth, uh, just talking to people who know more than I do. Um, I talked to some historians of medieval philosophy and asked them about what medieval philosophers thought when they talked about the ab esse ad posse principle. Um, and most of what I heard was, oh no, it wasn't really an inference from actuality to possibility in the contemporary sense. It's an inference from actuality to potentiality from a thing doing something to the thing having the potential to do it. And so in a way, I'm just going back to maybe an older understanding of the ab esse ad posse principle. Oops, oh, sorry, that was mixed up. Um, but I think that the form of inference um, is an abductive one. So we're going from 
what actually happens to part of what explains what happens, namely that there's, there are certain properties in place that make it possible for this to happen. And this, just, just as I said in the beginning, this is part of a bigger book project. Um, this, of course, fits with the idea that our mode of knowledge is basically initially tied to our understanding what we ourselves are capable of doing, and then sort of learning progressively uh, about other things, being able to do stuff as well. Now, if that's right, um, and again, here I'm in the relatively speculative part, if that's right, you might object, um, because now I've replaced a really lovely, deductively valid form of inference um, with a form of inference that sort of infers from something phi, therefore it had a potential to phi. And that's a form of inference that we all know to be pretty problematic in um, early modern philosophy. Um, and famously ridiculed by Moliere, not Moliere um, in the passage, uh, the what's it called in English, the imaginary invalid, um, in the passage um, where a doctor is asked about, um, well, no, the sorry, you all know the passage, I take it, but I'll just repeat. So there's this famous um, take up of early modern arguments against Aristotelian philosophy um, in Molière's imaginary invalid, where someone's being examined to become, I think, bachelor, baccalaureus, um, and he's asked, why does opium make people sleep? And he says, because it has a virtue, a virtuous dormitiva, a dormitive virtue, a power to put people to sleep. And then he's applauded and gets his degree. And of course, that's supposed to be entirely silly and horrible, and that's not how science is supposed to work. So does my suggestion not turn our ampliative inference um, into a sort of dormative virtue style inference, one which was rightly ridiculed in early modern philosophy? Sort of, to some extent, um, but um, as other people have pointed out, even the dormative virtue inference silly as it sounds, is not an entirely trivial kind of inference. Even in the case, the, the Moliere case, um, where you ask why does opium put people to sleep and you're saying because it has a dormitive power, it has the power to put people to sleep, uh, you're ruling out some things. Um, what you're ruling out is that, um, you know, the reason that people start fall asleep after ingesting opium is something external to the opium. Maybe, and this goes back to Peter Lipton, um, maybe it's the um, calming atmosphere of the opium den that really makes them fall asleep. Or um, maybe there's something else in, in the opium that we're giving people that really makes them sleep. So by saying that opium makes people fall asleep because it has a dormitive virtue, we're not saying nothing. We're at least saying it's something to do with the opium. Now, if that's all we said, um, that would be horrible science. Right? Um, the project for science is then to look, okay, why does opium have the dormitive virtue? What is its chemical composition? How does that chemical composition give rise to uh, the power to put people to sleep and so on and so forth? But now let me remind you, I'm not talking about science here. I'm talking about very natural, very ordinary ways of thinking and gaining knowledge. And those ways of thinking, once we make them explicit, very often sound silly and trivial. And that's perfectly fine because they are so natural that we don't need to make them um, um, explicit. So even if Moliere and all the early modern philosophers are right that dormitive virtues have no place, or if you take into account my first point, just a sort of tiny little initial first step place um, in science, that doesn't mean they don't have a place in our ordinary ways of thinking and knowing about the world. And in fact, I just want to submit that that is what we do when we see people ride a bike, we infer that they have the ability to ride a bike. When we see sugar dissolves off in coffee, we infer that it has power to dissolve in coffee. And that's very useful because we can project that kind of knowledge onto future occasions. So I think, um, I hope I can reject uh, the objection that this is a sort of bad dormative virtue style inference just by saying, Yes, it's a dormative virtue style inference, but dormative virtue style inferences 
aren't bad everywhere and they're perfectly fine in our ordinary thinking. And so I do think that this kind of inference can replace the um, rationalization of our ampliative inference that's based on axiom T, which by the way, sounds pretty trivial once you put it to people as well. Okay, now, if you're not super interested in modal epistemology, why should you be interested in, in this whole talk? I think there's a more general point that I've been making. And the more general point um, it can be phrased as a diagnosis. I think that philosophers in modal epistemology, but not only in modal epistemology, um, are very quick to project the kinds of theoretical insights that are our bread and butter and that we're very used to because, you know, uh, we took a class in modal logic or something, we've been sort of really socialized into thinking in this way. So I think philosophers might be a little too quick, a little too prone to project these theoretical insights that we have, having done some logic and having theorized, uh, to project those into our ordinary thought. Um, and I want to stress again that I am completely happy with the T-axiom as a matter of modal logic, as a matter of modal metaphysics. All I'm saying is sort of don't project it onto our ordinary ways of thinking about possibility. Um, it's really simple as it looks. It's a remarkable theoretical achievement um, to have the T-axiom. But if we want a plausible account of how humans, actual humans outside modal logic class, think and come to know things, um, it's best to be cautious of using too many of those insights, um, or rather of attributing too many of those insights to people. So maybe that's a more general point that might be interesting to you, even if um, you're not all that interested in modal epistemology. Here are the references um, that you saw on the slides, and I would like to thank you for um, well, your know, patience. I suppose I can only see a tiny little picture of you, and I look forward to discussing this with you. Wait, I, and I want to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roberto. Would you like five minutes of pause before we go for QA? Or would you... Sorry, would I like? Like five minutes of pause before QA, or do we go for QA directly? Oh, um, I think we can go into the Q&A directly also because I want to finish on time because there's another class that I need to teach. <laughs> so, questions? Thanks, uh, I, I'm not sure, are you, uh, is, are you understanding us if the sound is good? I think if there's just one person talking, it's fine. I can hear you just fine now. Yeah, I'm surprised about your uh, the last part of your talk because in what way logic is normative or not or because now you said that science maybe is not the way it's not an extension of ordinary language because it's a, it's already mm -hmm. towards formal language and metaphysics mm -hmm. so. And you say it's an achievement, the action key. So what, what is the normative status of uh, that kind of reasoning for, for us? Okay, very good. Yeah, I should have said this more clearly when I went through the quotations from all these people again. So I think there's just different things, obviously, you can be interested in, in doing epistemology, right? You can be just normative and say, here's a good way of thinking. Um, and, you know, we should strive to think in this way. And if that's your project, then, I mean, yours or anybody else's, um, if that's the project in, in um, these kinds of views that I gave you, Rock and Royce, Hawk and so on, then I haven't really objected to it or sort of, I, I kind of half objected to it. Um, so, okay, maybe I'll say how I would half object to it and then I say what the different project is and then we'll see it sort of gets a bit fuzzy. Um, if you think of epistemology, modal or otherwise, in normative terms, there's always a question of how far do you idealize? So for an idealized thinker, um, the sort of Rock or Royce argument, perfect, nothing wrong with it. Um, the idealized thinker, you know, just tell the idealized speaker to use one-sided possibility, which is the better notion anyway, because we have a nice amount of logic with it, and um, off they go, totally fine. Now, there's a weaker normative version, which is 
you know, this is how we humans ought to think, whether or not we do. And then I do have a bit of an objection, but again, it really depends on how much we idealize. Um, and the objection is, well, as long as we're not clear on our concept of possibility, we ought not to think like that um, because it's actually not deductively valid and it might lead us into contradiction. Um, so, but maybe I should tell you, we ought to get clear on our concept of possibility, right? So it's always a question of sort of how many idealizations do you put in? Okay, so that's why I sort of half disagree with it as, as a normative claim, as a normative theory. But there's a different project um, that I'm really interested in, although it's in a kind of tricky position. Um, and that's the project of not sort of saying how we ought to think, but looking at how we do think in the cases where things go well. So there's still a normative element in there. We're not sort of particularly interested in the fallacies. We want to figure out what we do when things go well. Um, but we are interested in what we actually do. Um, and so that's where it gets a bit problematic because then we need to talk to people who empirically study what we actually do. And, you know, it's not like we can look at our brains or whatever. Um, but anyway, that's that's a project that I think some people at least in modal epistemology take very seriously. It's the question is, look, we've got all this modal knowledge. How on earth did we get there? <laughs> how, how, how did we humans get all this modal knowledge when theoretically it looks so difficult? And so part of the project is really to say, look, it's not that difficult. There's there's an explanation for why we have this kind of modal knowledge. And then it's then I think you shouldn't be idealizing because you should just look at how we actually get to that kind of knowledge. And again, we're just looking at the good case where we do get knowledge, but we want to know what happens in those cases and not just how one ought to or could rationally go about it. Um, and if that's the project, and that's kind of a project I'm interested in, although I'm also interested in the others, but that's the project I see myself as pursuing, then I just want to say, look, Axiom T is just not a realistic description of the way we come to know um, modal truths. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right to put your finger on, on the normative question, um, because I wasn't very clear about, about what exactly the project was. But does that help? Yes, but uh, I wonder where you will put the, the scientific language. Mm. Right, I haven't responded to that, yes. Idealization, is this, is this still close to ordinary language? I don't know. Right, no, very good. Um, so I I don't think I want to make any strong claims about science. The only reason that I talked about science is that I want to say what the normative virtue objection really objects to is a scientific project. And all I want to do is say, that's just whatever's true about that project, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about ordinary people going around the world and gaining knowledge that they might use in sort of surviving the next day. Um, and for that, dormative virtue inferences are completely fine on a descriptive level, but I think also on a normative level. Um, the, pl the, the place of the dormative virtue objection is in... Well, I guess a normative, yeah, I see now why the normative descriptive comes in, um, is a normative theory of how science should proceed. And what I take the gist of the early modern objections to be is that science should, I mean, descriptively, they would have described science as doing just that. Um, I mean, with, with a grain of salt, maybe. Um, but they have the normative claim that that's not how to do science. Now, I'm not sure they were right about the science of their time. I, I have some sympathies with the Aristotelian tradition, but I wanted to put all that aside and just say, insofar as there's plausibility to the normative virtue objection, it's a normative claim about how to do science. It's neither a normative nor a descriptive claim about how to go about you know, gaining knowledge in ordinary life. Mm -hmm. And then there are all kinds of other things you might want to say about science vis-a-vis -vis ordinary knowledge and that I hope I can stay neutral on, although I think, they're all, although obviously, they're interesting questions. Thank you. Hello, question? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this talk. Um, 
I have a question concerning uh, the, the obligatures. Uh, so you gave uh, some examples of cases where um, there was um, uh, and the obligature was broken because it was a sentence within a longer sentence. Um, but were not these all cases of uh, cancellation? Where you mm -hmm. had uh, some aspect that cancelled out the obligature, which according to some people is uh, yeah. to distinguish uh, um, uh, an implicature from just a logical implication. Uh, then logical implications cannot be cancelled out by adding information. Yeah. Uh, 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 the implications can be cancelled. Uh, so that's the first, but then connected to that, um, is, is, is cancellation not a good criterion to, 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 to find out in this ordinary language whether we have a, a notion of possibility as contingency or the more like traditional notion of possibility, and wouldn't that like solve the whole issue uh, if that were true? Sorry, can you? I I lost track of what, what, which which this and that referred to. What exactly? Uh, what would solve which if, issue if what were true? Um, so if, if it were true that uh, we can uh, for possibility uh, find out whether um, whether we use. Um, whether it's a matter of pragmatics or um, let me think a bit. Uh, my question wasn't that clear. I can't, I realize now. So 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 if so, you could defend that uh, the T scheme is valid, uh, but the cases where it doesn't seem valid is because of uh, pragmatics that we. Um, and then, so like you could then have a clear if 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 we knew where the pragmatics where it was if we had a good like uh, operation not operationalizable criterion for everyday language to find out whether uh, there was an implicature involved or not by a, a character like cancellation. Uh, whether that would not help us to see whether in such circumstances the D scheme, uh, the D uh, axiom is valid uh, or whether it's not valid. That, that's oh, okay. 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 Good. Um, I think I'll start. No, I'll start with the first question. And um, I'll just say again, I'm drawing on lots of things that I'm not an expert on. You might be, you're probably more of an expert on this than I am. Uh, so, I'll just try, but um, so does cancel, I think the idea is that, why do you think it's a case of cancellation? Because the, I mean, cancellation usually works by just sort of retracting or sort of not retracting, but sort of basically just saying, and I don't mean that, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in the cases I gave you, we didn't do that. Although as I was reading them to you, I did realize that you have to sort of stress the sum and the can, um, and that that may indicate something, right? Um well, I should see the examples again because I don't have them fresh in my mind. But they, it, it seemed like there was always something added that suggested mm. bigotry that did not. Uh, Let's see. Yeah. Here we have. Here we have them. Yeah. Uh, if students pass, I'll be happy. Um, and then there is this but sentence uh, that suggests that you're um, contradicting. Right. Implicature, so, so you cancel the implicature out by um, by leaving open afterwards the possibility that all yeah. you see? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 If you can fire him, that's your call. Uh, but if you must fire him, so you contradict yourself immediately. Uh, yeah. If there were the implicature, so what you did implicitly has it was canceling out. Right. Even though you don't say it literally, like, but I don't mean uh, this or that, which people rarely do, I believe. Uh, and like, it's it's very unpractical to if, if you directly contradict yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I would call these like non-literal cases of, of cancellation, but maybe that's stretching the notion a bit. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. I think it just occurred to me what my response should be. And the response is that the noteworthy thing about this is that implication implicatures aren't cancelled. Um, right? What happens is that they're actually enforced. Um so what's really, and I, I probably didn't explain this very clearly, explain these examples very clearly, but um, what's going on here is that um, you could cancel the implicature. Uh, so let's maybe the happy and even happier, that sort of doesn't bring out the, the contradiction so much that you'd get. So maybe let's focus on the second case. I may have explained the first case wrong. Uh, because that's a bit confusing to myself as well. Um, let's focus on the second case. If can implicates that it's not the case that you must, right? Mm -hmm. That would be the scalar implicature. Then by canceling that, you would turn the can into a one-sided can. But what happens is precisely that the second sentence um, enforces the two-sided reading, which is supposed to be the pragmatic implicature. So you're not canceling anything. Yeah. Um, if there's an implicature, you're actually enforcing it rather than cancelling it. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So what happens here is not that we get rid of an implicature, but that we're actually sort of, the remarkable thing is that it remains in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I, I didn't think clearly about the second example. No, I, I, went, I went through this far too quickly, and it took me a while to realize that that's the response I <laughs> Um, yeah, but that's that's the that's the that's supposed to be the point. I just, I mean, I just got these examples from these linguistic texts. It's I'm 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 really not an expert on this. It just seemed to fit so nicely into my argument. Um, but that's the point precisely. You can't appeal to cancellation here because you're precisely not getting rid of the implicature. Mm -hmm. On the standard view, it shouldn't be there in the first place. The implicature. Um, because implicatures are supposed to disappear when you put the sentence into the antecedent of a conditional. Yeah. Right? Because they you get an implicature by saying something, by maybe asserting something, because that's where the Gricean maxims apply. But they don't apply to putting something into the antecedent of a conditional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks. That's very helpful. Well, it was helpful for me because I... While I was talking through this, I realized I wasn't very clear. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify. Um, but now you have to remind me of the other part of your question. One part of the question does not really apply anymore because uh, I now better understand your arguments. Okay, okay, good. Well, then thank you for making me clarify because it really wasn't very clear when you talk. More questions? Sure. Um, but I want to take on this, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, at the beginning, I was very impressed by the the, the, impl the implicative rating of um, the T action because it sounds it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, but after that, I said, does it mean that in ordinary life, we are agreed if P today, then possibly tomorrow. And if P today is because it was possible yesterday, and therefore there's something else. And so, in fact, we are unable to understand stochastic stuff or pure things that are even. And so we always presume that there's a blah, blah, blah in the past that is. Yeah. So, does the. Does, do, do I go too far in my interpretation? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the today and yesterday was just supposed to illustrate, of course, it doesn't have to be sort of, I mean, it's very often times, but um, it doesn't have to be. But I mean, I think you're right. It is an ampliative inference. And as such, um, it is definitely vulnerable to certain kinds of mistakes that you wouldn't get in a deductively valid inference like the actual T axiom. Um, I mean, that's always the, I don't know, I'm sure some of you do introduction to logic. That's always what I tell my students, um, the deductively valid things. They're lovely because you can't go wrong, but that's also why they're kind of boring. But the, the ampliative ones, that's where it gets really interesting, but also risky. And so I do think the ampliative inference is risky, and there are, cert there are probably certain associated fallacies. Um, I haven't looked enough into those fallacies, but I'm pretty sure there are. Um, and I would... I would um, suspect that a lot of them have something to do with 
from what I understand, the fact that we're naturally not very good at statistics. Um, I so, don't, my problem is not the failability, because of course that's we always do that, and I'm a philosopher of science, so, so yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. But the kind of conception of the world that is behind such a rule, I see. yeah. Is, a conception that everything has a cause. Mm. Oh, that. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get that. Um. Well, everything to which we apply the inference. Of course, we don't need to apply. I mean, we can see things happening and just sort of think, "Oh, that was just a fluke." I'm not going to draw any any inference about that. That's just that's just weird. Let's just sort of isolate that. And I think that's completely open. I'm not saying that every time something happens. I mean, that's true with the with the actual T axiom. Every time something happens, there you go. Um, but that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. But that's probably true for lots of amputative inferences. That sometimes you're given some premises and you just shouldn't draw the you shouldn't draw the inference. Um, that's true with induction. I take it as well. Um, but you're right that if we want to say what makes it a good um, form of inference, we need to say more than just this happened. <laughs> um, so what I haven't done at all, but, but what, what, I, what I am thinking about but haven't done in the talk at all, is sort of think about what makes the kind of inference I'm interested in into a good inference in some cases and a bad inference in others. Um, and so, I, and I think it's really complicated. It's really complex. So I do, oh, oh, there are so many things I want to say. So let me say some other things and then get back to this. Um, so I'm very impressed by the line of reasoning you find, for instance, in, in Peter Lipton, um, arguing that inference to the best explanation is extremely common. Um, now, Peter Lipton is interested in science, and once again, I'm interested here in just ordinary reasoning. And I think we just go around and infer causes all the time. Um, and the reason we're interested in inferring causes, and that's also a point from Peter Lipton, is that we can then project them into the future again and figure out, you know, if they caused it now, they're probably going to cause it again. So basically, I'm saying this is a, this is a case of that, um, and it's just that the, the potentials or whatever they're obviously not the main part of the cause, but they're sort of part, part of the cause. Um, I think Dretzky calls it a structuring cause, something that has to be in place for something else to do the causing. Um, and so, yes, I do subscribe to that bit, that we go around looking for causes and a lot of our inferential practices sort of fit with, with that, and this, this is a part of it. But um, then there's the other, there's the main dimension of your, well, the other dimension of your question, which is under what conditions is this a good inference? And I think like with most amplitude inference, it's gonna be really complicated. Um, so for many things, um, a single observation will not make it a good inference and you need a sort of track record. Um, that's definitely true. So as I said in the book manuscript from which this um, talk sort of uses material, I want to start with abilities, abilities that have something to do with agency. And there is a famous point uh, made by Anthony Kenny in the 70s that abilities do not go by the T axiom because, you know, I'm, I'm terrible at darts. I might throw a dart, hit the bullseye. It does not follow that I have the ability to hit a bullseye. I just get lucky. That's a fluke. Um, and I know that <laughs> if you give me a dart and I hit the bullseye, I'm not going to infer that I have the ability. Um, and probably for many cases of dispositions, that's true too. If you get angry just once, I'm not going to infer that you're an irascible person. Um, that would be sort of a typical case of a disposition. Um, but then there are other cases where we're quite happy to make the inference given just one case. If I see you ride a bike, I'm going to conclude that you have the ability to ride a bike because just what you do in riding a bike is just so incredibly unlikely to happen if you don't have the ability. Um, or Kenny's example is pushing your wife in a wheelchair across a rope or on a rope across Niagara Falls. If you do that once, we'll, we'll attribute the ability to you. I, I don't know. Um, um, but even riding a bike will do. Or there are cases where we think that the objects we're dealing with are just so regular in their behavior 
if the sugar dissolves and the coffee warms, I'll probably just assume that, well, it's new sugar, but basically that sugar always dissolves um, in that kind of liquid. Because, you know, it's not like, there's not a lot of variation with sugar. If it does it once, why would it do anything else there? So all I'm saying is that's a really interesting project, <laughs> thinking about when these inferences are good and under what conditions and when they're bad and what kind of fallacies we're prone to making. Um, and I think there are fallacies um, sort of in that area. I haven't I haven't spelled that out and all I'm saying is it's going to be complicated because like other forms of amplitude inferences, it really depends on the content and not just the form. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's uh, that was very useful to think about. Other questions? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did not really get um, in the beginning what this possibility was supposed to do in this argument around analogy. Uh, there was first the T, uh, the T, and then the anal analogy step. Uh, but like, well, why do you need the possibility? Is it like this intuition um, that like, like it, it seems like the possibility does some uh, epistemic work here, uh, like oh we can uh, uh, not conclude that 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 B is F, but just that well it's kind of plausible that B is F. Uh, uh -huh. so it's rather. To be about plausibility than about possibility. I see. Mm -hmm. Or it's not doing any work. I don't, so I didn't I don't see the, the argument here. Okay, okay, great. I'll just go through it again and then you let me know if that answered your question or not. because uh, mm -hmm. I, I went through it a bit quickly. Um so the the target of this kind of theory, as I understand it, is to rationalize. I can rationalize inferences like the following. My previous desk broke, therefore it's possible for my current desk to break as well. So my current desk is unbroken and I see that, no epistemic uncertainty about it, but I know that it can break. It, it's possible for it to break. And why do I know that? Because my previous desk broke. So the example is mine, Sonia Rockeroyce. I don't know where she gets it because I've never seen a desk break, but never mind. Um, and so, so it's supposed to rationalize an ampliative inference of the form. My previous desk did break, therefore my current desk, which I see is unbroken, is also such that it's possible for it to break. And the rationaliz rationalization goes as follows. It uses the deductive principle, the T axiom, to get from actuality to possibility. So this is where the modality comes in. It's just with the logic, right? Um, the previous desk broke. Therefore, it's, it, it is possible that the previous desk broke. I mean, people are playing fast and loose, loose with tenses there. Um, so let's just say the previous desk is broken. Therefore, it's possible for the previous desk to be broken. And so we, now we look at now I look at my current desk. I say, well, you know, it's the same kind of desk, made of similar materials, subject to the same kinds of laws and law-like generalizations. Um, you know, whatever's true of my previous desk is probably true of this one as well, except for things that I see are not the case. This one's not broken. And therefore, since my previous desk, as I've inferred by axiom T, is such that it's possibly broken because it's actually broken. I can infer that my current desk is such that it's possibly broken or that it's possible for it to be broken as well, despite the fact that right now it's clearly not broken. So, sorry, I kept stressing this despite the fact that it's not broken just to stress that it, it's not supposed to be an epistemic point. It's really just to think what's possible for one thing or what's, what's possible for one thing to do or what's what could possibly happen to one thing based on what we've seen actually happen to another thing. And the strategy is to sort of start with the other thing that we've seen something happen to and introduce the modal stuff there, 
where it really doesn't do anything because we already know what actually happens. Who cares about the possibility? But that's where the logic takes us and then take the ampliative bit to sort of talk about the possibilities over here with, with the thing where we haven't yet seen them actualized. I'm not sure if that was any clearer, so I'll just... Uh, yeah, yeah, that helps. Um, I'm still not very convinced that it's uh, that the possibility is doing much work here. I see why um, why it gives the intuition, like, of course, uh, I don't want to infer that my table uh, uh, breaks right now because it broke yesterday or something like that. Uh, I only want to say that it's, I don't only want to like uh, apply the the argument to the possibility, but that seems for different reasons that have nothing to do with modality. It's more like um, um, the sort of things that we uh, see as being uniform or something uh, and, and that it's kind of, very unlikely that something that the table would break or something uh, that would make it uh, wrong analogy, uh, analogical reasoning to conclude that my table will break right now. And I don't know, it seems that for some cases uh, you might want to apply the, the, the analogical reasoning without the possibility of greater. Um, and, and so I didn't see, and I still don't see what, uh, what uh, the importance of the possibility of greater, that seems to more be a matter of we see the breaking as something exceptional uh so okay okay no I th okay maybe then the ex i mean i took the example from 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 the paper but i think we could just just as easily use an example of something utterly unexceptional like my example of the sugar dissolving in my coffee so um, this sugar cube dissolved in my coffee therefore it's possible for this sugar cube to dissolve in my coffee that other sugar cube is just like it, so it's possible for that other sugar cube to dissolve in my coffee. Now, the um, why is that interesting? Ooh, <laughs> not very interesting, but it's so this is supposed to. Mm, how do I start? No, so the background to this is, as I as I said a, a while ago now, so uh, <laughs> hard to keep in mind. Um, the the whole. That whole account is sort of trying to answer the question, given that we know so much about ordinary possibilities, how on earth do we get that knowledge? Yeah. And the way this response works, although of course it's not my response, I've argued against it, but the way this response works is, well, we do some logic and then we do some ordinary analogical reasoning and then we're done. And that explains how we have this knowledge. It doesn't tell us that this is an interesting inference to make. It just, again, this is, again, going back to the sort of descriptive project, um, just noting we've got this knowledge, which is sort of, it's a bit like, you know, um, clearly we know something about how other people feel, but how on earth could I know about your feelings because they're inside you and I'm outside. So it's a bit like that. Like, clearly we have this kind of knowledge. How on earth can we explain that we get that kind of knowledge? How could that have worked <laughs> given the sort of capacities we have? And so that's the question it's meant to answer. Given that we have all this knowledge about what's, what's possible, how on earth could we have got there? And here's one way um, that it seems plausible we got there in pretty unmysterious ways. Yeah, yeah I see. Um, and then I have another question that's kind of related, uh, at least in my head it's related. Uh, but, but but so there is this important distinction between um, like the contingent usage of, of, of mm. a possibility and the more uh, the more as we use the philosophy. Um, but isn't there like a much more uh, even uh, I guess more difficult uh, disambiguation help happening if you think about natural language, namely that it's between epistemic modality and uh, nomological or metaphysical modality. I have the impression that we rarely use the word possible in oh, its typical or nomological sense, and it's usually some kind of um, an epistemic notion. And in, in, ordinary in ordinary language, yeah. And, uh, and, and I have the, even the impression that the T even though usually people expect uh, accept also the, the, the action for epistemic uh, uh, plausibility or whatever, or epistemic yeah. 
being compatible with our knowledge. Um, but I, I don't see it, at least for compatibility, if that's your epistemic notion that what possibility is supposed to represent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Convinced uh, the T uh, action is like a logical principle because we might, um, I mean, if it, it has to be compatible and suppose we are in a paradoxical situation uh, where we have uh, the liar sentence being true or something like that, uh, um, like what, what is compatible with our knowledge is certainly not uh, that the liar sentence is true because that's like the knowledge on that point is not, uh, there's nothing compatible with it, with it because it's already incoherent uh, to start with. So the notion of compatibility seems to be an intrinsically ampliative notion. Uh, we guess what is compatible and later we found out, find out that it's not compatible and so on. Uh, so for for some notions, at least, of epistemic modality, I am. I find it kind of very natural to look for an ampliative version of the, the okay. rule. But I'm not convinced this is the case for uh, the, the sort of nomological uh, uh, possibility, if it even exists in that natural language. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's lovely. I, I actually agree with uh, most of what you said, I think. So I'll just add something to it. Um, so I am really interested in what I'm doing here in the whole project that this is a part of in a notion of possibility that is not epistemic. Um, so I call it objective possibility, and that includes nomological, practical, but I think metaphysical possibility, at least I think people are not always really clear on what they mean by metaphysical possibility, but the sense in which I want to use it, and I think you can find that in Kripke, is just the sort of broadest objective possibility, so quite distinct from epistemic again. And I completely agree with you that outside the philosophy literature, people do not use the word possible generally for objective possibility. Um, I just just now, when I tried to paraphrase the Sonia Rockeroy's argument for you, I sometimes said, possible for the desk to break. I think that's the only construction with possible that sort of manages to express objective possibility. In English, I'm a native speaker of German and that's different again. Um, and I suppose you're native, many of you are native speakers of French and I have no idea how that works. Um, so, but the default is for the word possible to express epistemic possibility. And I think philosophers who talk about metaphysical possibility and consult their intuitions about what's possible have failed to appreciate that. Um, so with that, I'm completely on board with you. Now, I think that's a point in my favor. I think the one way in which we've really managed to express a kind of objective possibility in ordinary language is the modal auxiliary can. That, that is, um, at least in English, but from what I understand in most languages, that modal auxiliary is sort of the most natural reading of that is objective and not epistemic. Um, in German, we've got an expression that's kind of, it can be that, and then that becomes epistemic. But if you just use can, uh, that tends to be objective. Um, and so one of the reasons I like to start my modal epistemology with abilities um, is, I mean, I don't want to do semantics, but epistemology, but the firmest grip we have on anything that's both objective and modal is stuff like, I can ride a bike. There's nothing epistemic about that. Uh, you know, it's not just compatible with what I know. It's like, literally, I have what it takes to ride a bike. Um, that to me seems to me the paradigm example of an objective modality. Um, and so if we want to understand objective possibility and not sort of accidentally talk about epistemic possibility, I think that's where we should start. Um, and I also think that's what we probably are best at recognizing for the simple fact that if we didn't know what we can and can't do, um, it would be really difficult to do anything. Uh, we'd just be sort of flailing around trying things that don't work. Um, and so um, what I want to, yeah, my, my, my point, I'm just agreeing with you and telling you how that fits into other things I want to say. It also fits with my sort of speculative suggestion at the end of the talk, because really what I want to say is that we infer from what happens 
to underlying properties of things that sort of enable what happened. Um, and those, again, are just the underlying properties that we would ascribe maybe with the modal auxiliary can. Um, which, so this is another thing. Um, again, I, I'm sorry, I'm not there in person, otherwise I would know more about who has which background, but um, one thing that linguists and philosophers of language have noticed is that there's actually a syntactic difference between epistemic and objective modality. So deontic modality is kind of tricky, but epistemic and objective are sort of clearly set apart in that epistemic modality is expressed with sentence operator that takes scope over tense and aspect, right? It's possible for it to have rained yesterday. It's possible for him to be running a marathon now. Uh, sorry, it's possible that he is running a, sorry, not for him. It's possible that he is running a marathon now. Perfectly fine, clearly epistemic. Um, but when you want to express something objective, um, it tends to be done in, in a way that looks more like you have a predicate operator that just takes a predicate and then scopes under tense and aspect. I can ride a bike. Yeah, I can be riding a bike. I can have ridden a bike. Um, and the po it's possible for someone to do something, construction, I think, manages to express objective possibility precisely because it sort of gives you that kind of structure. Um, and so, again, it seems to me that if we want an inference that works for objective possibility, it's best to make an inference that actually takes this form. We're attributing modal properties to things as opposed to we take a whole proposition and then assign some modal status to it, because that's what we do with epistemic possibility. Um, so, again, I'm agreeing with you and just saying, yay, and that really fits with the other things I want to say. <laughs> I don't know. Is that, do you, does that sound okay to you? That's, that, that's very that's very reasonable and, and, and interesting. Um, it, it's just that I that that, it, that I'm not convinced that if objective uh, possibility is expressed in this way by saying it's possible for or by saying I can ride a bike or something that the instances where you would like have something similar to the uh, the T rule, T action, yeah. would actually not be the T ah. because it would have a more complex uh, logical form. Yeah. Um, especially the example of, of, of going from uh, somebody swims to somebody can swim uh, is, is, is a very difficult sort of inference yeah. in, that is not uh, at all from A to possible A. Yes. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Because it involves abilities and so on. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that fits very nicely with the conversation I had with, sorry, I didn't even catch your names, with the colleague who's sitting right next to you uh, just before. Um, so I, the way I think about it is that I like to think there is such a thing as objective possibility. I don't think it's very easy for us to get a grip on it. I think that by itself is a kind of, maybe you don't need to do philosophy and modal logic to get there, but it's kind of cognitive achievement to have a notion of a pure objective possibility. Um, and sorry, again, I'm just, I'm just gesturing at the, the book project that I'm working on, but um, what I try to do there is um, I, um, I don't know if you've come across this. Some people think it's very obvious and some people have never heard of it. Um, so what I try to do is I use a method from Grice actually called creature construction. And I try to show that starting with the concept of ability and some other cognitive capacities that we have, you can relatively naturally get to a concept of mere possibility uh, that's sort of much weaker than ability, um, that's sort of not so clearly tied to, to a particular object. And that's, that's a useful concept to have because sometimes it's really useful just to consider what could happen, um, you know, um, how things could turn out um, in an objective sense. I think that's a really useful thing to be able to think about. Um, and so I do think we sort of have that concept, but it's not very, we need to sort of say funny things like, we need to sort of have a dummy dummy subject for the can, right? Uh, how things could turn out, um, um, or it could happen that. Um, 
So, so I do think we have that concept, but it's not very easily expressed. I do think it's a useful concept to have. And I ultimately want to say that it's a concept that you can sort of develop out of the more natural concepts of abilities and dispositions and so on. I haven't told you anything about that in this talk, obviously. Um, and then that's a concept which once you have a philosopher look at it, it makes a lot of sense to say that that concept should be treated such that it validates the T axiom. But I mean, that's the whole point. That's why I said that's a really big theoretical achievement. That's not something that we just know by having some concept of possibility, um, of objective possibility. I haven't said anything about liar paradoxes and epistemic possibility, but I think I don't have much to say on that. So does that? It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it just, like, of course, this notion is difficult in combination with natural, natural language, and it's going to need a lot of ambiative reasoning to develop it and so on. Um, but, like, once you have it and you made it clear what it meant to some, like, ordinary language users, um, to some way you can give examples or something, you don't have to introduce, like, semantics. Mm -hmm. From that point on, mm -hmm. you can use the T axiom. And the T axiom holds. Uh, yeah. So there is no point at which it ever was ambiguous. You know, it, it was before it didn't exist because you didn't have the concept. And then you make it, you introduce it in a language uh, community, and then it holds. Uh, <laughs> it, holds. it holds, but that doesn't mean that, that we can just. Yeah, I think there's a really tricky question here about what it means to have a concept. Yes. Um, and I think the, so I, I, oh, I, I tried to go into that and then it just, it's such a mess <laughs> and so, so tricky and I'm not sure I need to take a stand. So I'm interested, ultimately I'm not interested in the concept, I'm interested in knowledge, but I tend to sort of switch over to concepts because of the way in which I'm spelling it out. And so the concept of concept that I'm interested in is just whatever it takes to think and ideally, if possible, gain knowledge about something. But that's a bit too weak because, you know, if um, you need to be sort of clear about something like guises or a derated dicto distinction. So I want to say that um, the ancient Greeks had a concept of water, but not of H2O, even though, of course, they had what it took to gain knowledge about H2O because they knew a lot about water. Um, but I also want to say that we can have a concept about something while being pretty ignorant about it. Um, and so I think most people need a concept of concept that works roughly like that, and I'm not quite sure what the stable intermediate position is. But I do think it's possible to have a concept in the sense of the ability to think and know about something under the right kind of guise, whatever that means. And yet sort of be ignorant of a lot of aspects of that. And so that's how I'm thinking of our ordinary concept of a mere possibility. We do have a concept of something which I think is actually governed by the T axiom, but that doesn't mean that we know it's governed by the T axiom. Right. Okay, I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I hope that's a stable position. <laughs> Charles? Yeah, this, first of all, thanks. Yeah, excellent talk. Good to see you. Uh, it's, it's, um, it was more fun in Canberra, but anyway. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Belgian <laughs> one. It's, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, really like, I, I feel like, well, I perhaps like most is just the orientation. Project because I think this the idea that this idea of, of trying to find you're mentioning at the beginning of the QA this kind of uh, uh, the sweet spot in terms of idealization. I think that's a yeah. really that's a really neat idea. And it reminded me of, and I so partly what I'm trying what I would like to do is just encourage I just want to hear your thoughts about where else you think this winds up having big impacts in modal epistemology. Because maybe this reminded me of. Um, my my grand epistemology seminar, uh, a, a non-trivial fraction of it was Bob Audi pounding the table and basically doing this for non-modal epistemology, going like, look, 
everyone is so apt to give everyone so many beliefs. Philosophers want to fill everybody's heads with gajillions of beliefs, right? And like maybe at best we could be disposed to form huge numbers of beliefs, but like the average person has uh, maybe a couple of occurrent beliefs at any moment in time. And like, that's if we're being generous, right? Like we don't, we don't just carry around hundreds of thousands of occurrent propositional beliefs inside our brains, right? This is not a thing we do. And I think partly, you know, it was, I think he was grasping at the kind of thing that you're doing here, right? This idea that we're trying to find the right level of idealization where okay, maybe in some kind of radically more idealized sense, I have an infinite number of, I don't know, beliefs about arithmetic or something, right? Like maybe I have, maybe I have a hyper idea, but I, but, but clearly I don't really have, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I like the project so much that, so beyond the T-axiom, give me a flavor of where else you see this having uh, other cool impacts in modal epistemology. And how does this distinguish your project from some of the other stuff that's on offer in modal epistemology, just because I, I think it's me. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna tell you more about the general project and then we'll see how that fits with the more general methodological point. Um, so here's the shape of the project. As I said, it's a book, it's a book-sized project um, and it, it proceeds as follows. <laughs> Um, what I really care about uh, in the beginning is what, with some others, I call agentive modality. And agentive modality includes ability, which, as we saw earlier, is different from mere possibility. And ability is something that you have some control over as an agent. Um, it also includes the affordances of things. Um, affordances, obviously, are very popular in the philosophy of perception, very you know, highly ambiguous term. I'm using it in the following sense, a very simple sense. Um, uh, an object affords firing to me just in case I can fire it. Um, so, you know, so it, it's just the counterpart to my abilities, basically, on the side of the objects I'm interacting with. Um, these are really, and I really, and I want to say that the, the sort of really crucial notion is that of an ability, as I said, in a strong sense, and also in the sense uh, often called general ability, where I can retain my abilities over a long stretch of time, even in the absence of opportunities to exercise it. Okay, and then I start with an argument, and that in some sense is something I think people don't do much in mode epistemology, with an argument from the philosophy of action that I sort of briefly gestured at earlier, just saying that, look, um, we're limited agents. Um, there are some things we can do and lots of things we can't do. And yet we are incredibly successful in our intentional actions. I mean, maybe not always in the ones that matter, but in all kinds of little things, we're pretty good. Um, and so, you know, that would be entirely inexplicable if we didn't have ways of tracking what we can and can't do. Um, and you can look at infants. Um, they're flailing around because precisely they're trying to figure out what they can and can't do. And that's how the developmental psychologists often describe it. And then I have some extra arguments saying, you know, it's very unlikely that these ways of tracking are sort of mere beliefs. It's very likely their knowledge, especially with general abilities, because we keep getting feedback. Okay. And so, and then it, it also applies not just to our own abilities, but because we interact, it also applies, we must, we, we need knowledge of other people's abilities for most of the actions we do. And then basically the, the conclusion of this chapter is, look, given how easy it is for us to act, um, intentionally in tandem with each other, um, it must be super easy for us to know about our own abilities and the abilities of others and the affordances in the world around us. That must be so easy, in fact, <laughs> that why not put it at the very beginning of modal epistemology? And I have some arguments that other approaches in modal epistemology, like the T-act, like the um, version I just talked about, but also the counterfactual approaches or perception-based approaches, don't give us that. And so this is really a genuine starting point for modal epistemology. And um, because you were interested in the methodological stuff, I think that is kind of the moral I gave at the end of this talk, is to say abilities are really, really complicated when you look at them through the lens of modal logic. They're conceptually a mess. And, um, you know, possibility is super nice and clean. Um, and I think philosophers have been too tempted to project the nice and clean stuff into our heads 
um, when really it's the messy stuff that we need to survive and act that's really there. Uh, just like um, I think a nice analogy is um, we're really good at generics. Like everybody, kid, children master generics long before they master the universal quantifier. Philosophers and linguists despair of the generic and are really happy with the universal quantifier. So the conceptually simple, nice and clean and the cognitively easy and early and maybe basic tend to come apart. So that's kind of the moral. And then I try to give an epistemology for agentive modality, which is pretty flat footed. It's just sort of you act. So it's the kind of abductive reasoning I talked about, but coupled with something like the experience of your own agency. Still not quite happy with that. That's sort of what it is. Um, and then, as I said earlier, then I do this creature construction bit where I say, now imagine a creature that has knowledge of agentive modality, abilities and affordances, but no concept of mere possibility at all. Now add to that creature certain capacities that we humans have, but that have nothing to do with modality. So uh, the easiest case is the ability to sort of objectivize. Um, and there's a nice precedent for that in causal cognition, because it seems people seem to agree that our knowledge of causation really starts like um, chronologically in, in life, starts with sort of agentive stuff. Um, and it takes children some years <laughs> to get to a point where they can sort of see that inanimate things can cause stuff in just the same way that they themselves can. And so we must have some capacity that allows us to move beyond the agenda. Some people think only humans can do that. Um, some people think apes don't do it, that apes have a sort of purely agenda notion of causality. I don't know, just stuff I read looked interesting. So we need, we seem to have some capacities that enable us to go beyond the agenda standpoint to a more objective standpoint. Whatever they are, we can apply them to our abilities um, in principle to get to a more objective notion of modality. Um, and then there are other capacities we need to get to something like mere possibility that would be subject to the T axiom. And then the stuff I presented today is from another chapter which says, well, you know, that was just creature construction. It just shows you it could come about like this, but actually if we think that's how it works, there are all kinds of things that fall into place very nicely. Um, even thinking about the imagination works really nicely if you take a more sort of agency-based standpoint and so on. Um, and then finally, I want to say, well, what do we mean by metaphysical possibility? Um, well, just um, whatever this kind of possibility is in the most general sense. Um, and then that tells us something about how to think about metaphysical possibility. So, sorry, you asked about the project, that's the project. Um, and I think, I hope, I, I haven't said anything about idealization, but I really like um, at least some parts of a paper by Daniel Nolan called Naturalized Moral Epistemology, where he says what we should be doing is look at cases where we are modalizing well and identify what it is that we're doing there. And that's sort of what I take myself to be doing. And then from there, we can derive some suggestions for places where we don't know if we're modalizing very well and want to think about how to do it better. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the shape of the project. Does that sound? Yeah, that's really helpful, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking. So we still have five or so minutes. Yeah, maybe you want to ask your questions. Because I have more. <laughs> I have one question, but I don't know if it maybe uh, misses the point. But I was wondering how, when you go from the, the one-sided to the two-sided possibilities, how it interacts with a uh, type of um, use problem or with the reduction arguments. Because so can you say that again with the interacts with the use problem or reduction reduction because. If uh, what you are saying by saying that something is possible is just that it's uh, contingently, possi contingently possible, is it enough to justify you doing inference from it? To so, uh, do inference from, from this case that another case would be possible, oh, same instance. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you just can you just ask the question again? I'm I'm, yes. I'm a little tired and the acoustics isn't great. How probably maybe that point question is not very good. But I was wondering, like, um, I understand why if you have the reasoning that you propose what you showed from the old hours, you could answer to kind of feel of induction that um, 
the possibility is uh, deductively strong enough that if you can show that uh, your new desk is close enough and converted to the older desk, you have reason to generalize the induction. But if what you infer from uh, the fact that something is, is just contained like, is, it's not like, possible in a more uh, strong substantial model way, do you have enough reasons to uh, infer that your uh, desk, even if it's close enough to the former desk, have the possibility to break? Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm sorry, this is not your fault at all. Uh, I, I'm still not sure I got everything. Um, but so, so let me try and repeat and then you tell me if I got it right. It, it really is the, the acoustics and, and the fact that I've been teaching all day. Um, so even on the two-sided notion, the, the sort of argument that I gave should still work uh, because I mean, st even if I have a two-sided notion of possibility, the fact that the previous desk broke gives me some reason to think that it was possible for it to break, right? Is that Does that go in the right direction? Yeah, I suppose, but, but because if it's just contingent that it breaks, there is no reason to think that it's, there is some uh, causality or some more modal stuff. That right. Right? right, okay. So... So I think if we have the two-sided notion of possibility, and I, I know that my previous desk has broken, um, in a way I can still infer that it was possible for it to break. Um, I mean, even, even just because, uh, but given that it wasn't necessary, right? That's, we need to put that in as an extra premise and then it's fine. And then maybe we don't need the extra premise because most of the things we see happening aren't necessary. And so it usually works. So there are two ways to go. One is, yes, there's, a, there's an inference there with just one premise. It did break, therefore it possibly breaks. And that inference is just not deductively valid, but still usually good. So it's no worse than the inference that I suggested. Um, and I think that's true and that's fine. Um, I think the ambition of the project I was talking about is a bit more. It's to tell us that, you know, logic alone will give it to you. Um, and here we get something a bit different, something that's usually going to work. Um, so it's sort of at least a step in the direction that I want to take of saying it's purely appetitive. The other, the other version would be to say it broke and it didn't necessarily break. Um, because, you know, it wasn't broken for a long time. Um, and that's, again, I think that's a perfectly fine inference. It's even deductively valid. Um, the problem here is that the ambition for this inference was supposed to be that it takes us from the non-modal to the modal, and now we need an extra modal premise. And that's why that's sort of, I think, not a satisfying version. So I think the first version, which is probably the one you had in mind, is a more satisfying version. Um, so what do I think about that? Well, then we need to know sort of how that, how that kind of inference is warranted, justified, what that's underwritten by. And if it's just underwritten by, the, by our implicit knowledge that most of the things that happen aren't necessary, then again, we have a sort of modal premise in there that wasn't supposed to be in there. But if it's instead underwritten by something like things usually happen because there was a possibility that enabled them, then it's really close to the thing that I want to say and it's sort of hard to, hard to even distinguish it anymore. Um, I think that's, it's, it's a very good question. I didn't address that at all. Um, but I think one way or the other, the ambitions of, of or the, the sort of, I mean, you just get these quick statements like, well, that's an obviously easy way of getting knowledge of possibility. That's the one thing that I want to get rid of and say, no, it's not that easy. And then you get the um, place where it's actually put to use, um, Peter Hawke, Sonia Rock Royce. Um, and there I want to say, mm, it doesn't work the way you want it to work. But I think you're right, it could work in a slightly different way. And in fact, the things I say, once you get rid of axiom T and put in some, some ampliative stuff, Sure, I can still go along with some of that. Um, but yeah, but I want to say that it's purely ampliative and it's not an actual axiom and we're not just using pure logic there. Okay. Well, 
Thanks for answer. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you for um, making that clear. Alexander, do you have a question? I think we have a bit of time. Uh, so, so if it's a quick question. I have always questions. It's good. So, but maybe Florian, you want to know that's something I get. So, so I had a worry during the way you talked, but now I have a, the worry is confirmed by uh, the plan of the book. <laughs> okay, well, let, tell me. <laughs> book isn't finished yet. I, I, I still have time to change. I'm completely finding a good idea for general epistemology because yeah. to switch from capacity to know how from declarative language, declarative knowledge as the main kind of knowledge is probably a way to get rid of complex problem of general epistemology, internalism, externalism, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. As an inspiration for metaphysics at the end, I worry about the fact that it will give us something like the dispositional stuff. And I'm not sure it's the right way to think about like quantum mechanics or something like something that's profoundly non-human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I can't, I would be lying if I said that the epistemology I like has nothing to do with the metaphysics I like, and I like the disposition of this metaphysics. Um, and so in some sense, the book I'm writing now is kind of the companion volume to, to the, the book I've written before. But I do want the two projects to be at least um, logically independent of each other. So I was really brief on the metaphysical part. Um, what I really want to say there, and that's, that chapter is still very much work in progress. What I really want to say there is that um, um, I want to think of the notion metaphysical possibility as a little bit like a natural kind term in Kripke. Um, with, so a natural kind term in Kripke takes paradigmatic instances and then says, whatever this is, and we don't need to know exactly what it is, that and everything that's also like that. Um, and so I want to say that the word metaphysically possible picks out whatever the underlying metaphysics is of these ordinary possibilities, and then everything like it that we haven't really covered with our ordinary models. And so if I'm right, <laughs> then of course, let's just, just think about dispositions. But it might be, and I'm perfectly open to this possibility insofar as I'm an epistemologist of modality, um, it might be that this whole stuff about abilities and powers is just our natural way of thinking about it. But then when you really look at the underlying metaphysical structure, that might be something quite different. And then when you think systematically about that, you'll just get a lot more. Uh, you'll get a lot of stuff that looks nothing like abilities and dispositions. Um, so that's how I want to leave room for that. And then the recommendation, so I think doing epistemology of ordinary modality is, as I said earlier, the project is really just to explain how it is that we have the knowledge that we undisputedly have. Doing epistemology of metaphysical modality to me is more like make some recommendations for how to get the knowledge that we would like to have because we don't really know if we have it. Um, and the recommendation I make is kind of boring, but it says, look, um, just theorize, <laughs> just develop your best theory of the ordinary modality, your best metaphysical theory of what the nature of that is and then take that theory and run with it. And then that will help you know about metaphysical modality. So the only way it's tied to the, to the powers and so on stuff is that those are the paradigmatic examples, but it might be that the underlying metaphysics looks really different. And then that's what you should be thinking about in metaphysics. So, yeah. In return to the first question I asked you, is there some continuity between natural language and scientific language? and natural uh, ordinary knowledge and scientific knowledge or is there a break and of course yeah. in history, there's a tradition that more and more we want to see a continuum but of course there's some philosopher in the past that were saying there's a break and if there's a break it's quite difficult to understand how us human you manage when we were doing science to develop something that is completely yeah, yeah. <laughs> through our tools of every day so yeah. the Exists much more convincing. Mm. Yeah, so I like the I like the continuity picture. Um, but I worry because if everything is dispositional, and uh, some physicist says time does not exist, I'm screwed. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. That's uh, that, that's the risk. We we we. Sorry, what does the physicist say? Time does not exist. No. Time does not exist. I think we can have just because I, I see how the dispositional language is very convincing. It's a it's a it's a. Good yeah. To, to map a lot of stuff, and if you're careful about the normative, uh, of course, because that's yeah, yeah. Yeah. that's Molière is specifically attack, attacking also Aristotle there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Position, but if you are careful about that, that that seems tremendous. That seems marvelous. Mm -hmm. um, not so much, but yeah, you already put change by hand in the thing, and the goal of metaphysics is to explain change. Uh, Why time exists, and maybe time does not exist, and I know. <laughs> okay, I'm. I have. I have written a tiny little bit about that. I'm not sure, um, but I do think. I mean, I think that's just a risk we run with metaphysical theories. That it might turn out that that our best sciences just make them implausible. I think there are reasons to think that. You know the dispositional stuff does make sense of of a lot of our scientific theories and practices, and that's I think is a point in favor of it. But um, yeah, I think I think there's not much more I can I can say about that, especially given that I'm supposed to be in my class, uh, the class I'm teaching now. But um, I just want to stress again that that's a different question. The as I said, the 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 epistemology I'm recommending can definitely do without dispositions in the metaphysics, if that's what you think is the underlying metaphysics. Um, and it might be that my epistemology tells you what makes my metaphysics attractive without making it true, namely the fact that that's how we naturally think about modality, even if we're wrong. Um, yeah. I would agree, yeah. <laughs> I still hope the metaphysics is right too, but otherwise at least I have the epistemology to retract too. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for a wonderful discussion. Um, it was a pleasure to meet you or see you again. Um, and yes. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. Eugene will throw a beer as a drink, but send you with it. When you come to Rwanda, we will throw you a beer with it. Thank you very much again for being there and for the time. And have a good day. Thanks so much. And thank you for a lovely discussion. Thank you.